I want to uh, start this morning in our sermon. This is our last installment of the Wait For It series. We've been in a series called Wait For It, and you have to say it that way. You've got to say, Wait For It. Somebody say, Wait For It. That's been the name of our series, and um, it's been a, a powerful and important series for a lot of us, especially those of us who don't like to wait for it, you know? Um, some of us are uh, better at patience than others. Um, and so today I want to close it out on a passage of Scripture from the, uh, the Apostle Paul to the Romans, because in this, in this passage, I think he gives us the key to being able to wait with patience. The key to being able to wait for it. Here's what he says. He says, I consider that our present sufferings, somebody say present. Present, present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be, somebody say will be, will be, will be revealed in us. In other words, what he's saying is your future is going to be better than your present. Even if your present is good, your future is going to be better than your present. In fact, he's saying this, if you are under pressure or you, if you are struggling, if you are experiencing hardship right now, he said, honestly, those hardships, those difficulties, those challenges, that pressure is not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in those of us who are seeking to follow Jesus. It says, uh, but you're going to have to wait for it. You're going to have to wait for it. Next verse says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. In other words, you're not the only one waiting. The whole creation is waiting. We're all waiting for God to be revealed in us, for us to become who God designed us to be. The whole creation is waiting for God to, to consummate his kingdom on the earth, for justice to be on the earth where there is injustice, for peace to come where there is pain for joy to come where there is suffering, for beauty to come where there are ashes. He, we're all waiting. The whole creation is waiting. And then he takes it even further. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So now he introduces this, the, the, the metaphor of childbirth. And what he's saying is these pains, the, the, birth of, the, the pains of childbirth are both predictive and productive. They predict something that's going to happen, and then they, in fact, produce that thing that's going to happen, and then they also, uh, we, we learn, at least every mother in the first service agreed with me, is that the pain is worth the thing that is being produced. In other words, it's the, the, the pain that you're experiencing right now is not even worth comparing to the glory that will be produced through the pain. Can I get that? Now, my, now Sister Cosby has had... Uh, how many kids have you had, Sister Cosby? Eleven children. So she's agreeing with me. So I don't even care if y'all, the rest of you don't agree. <laughs> because she said amen. Amen. Um, then it says this, for in this hope, all right, this is what we're going to focus on. In this hope, hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. We read this last week, but I want to drill down on this. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? We don't hope for things we already have because we already have them. And then this is the key. This is, this is the key right here. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, then we... No, you didn't say it right. Come on. <laughs> if we hope for what we do not yet have, then we... Wait for, wait for it patiently. So we're in this series called Wait For It. And um, the premise of the series is that when the Bible calls us to wait... When the scripture calls us to wait, and we're in, an, we're in what's called the Advent season, where it's a season of waiting. It's a waiting for God to come and, and be in our hearts. And it's an expectant waiting uh, that the ancient Israelites had for the Messiah to come. And, and it's even a waiting for a future uh, kingdom when Jesus comes and it reigns victorious again in our hearts and our lives. It's a period of waiting. And we titled this series, Wait For It, because this, this phrase has become a popular phrase in culture. Uh, and when you hear the phrase you know that something is about to happen. Uh, in fact, the, the, the way that the, the phrase is said is said with an expectation, an anticipation that something is going to happen. And there are, you know, hundreds of videos on YouTube uh, and online that basically just say, wait for it. And when you click on one of those videos, you know that you're going to watch something that might be a little bit monotonous, maybe even a little boring for the first period of the video, 
But you got to keep watching because something valuable, something interesting, something exciting, something good is going to happen. Uh, and I just want to thank Hallie Nyans uh, for scouring the internet and finding these wonderful wait for it videos. Uh, can we just hear it for Hallie wherever she is right out there? Right? Um, and um, do you guys want to see one more? This is the last one. The one, one more. Anybody want to see it? You guys want? All right. Turn it up a little bit. Wait for it. 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 All right, there it is. Okay. Woo. I think that one lasted just a little bit too long for me. I started to grow a little impatient there towards the end. Um, but the idea in, in, in this whole series, what we're learning from the scripture, is that God calls us, when God calls us to wait, he's not calling us to a passive acquiescence. He's not calling us to sort of a languishing waiting. He's calling us to an anticipatory, expectant kind of waiting uh, on God. And, and, and he even says in, uh, in Isaiah, it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So we, we've been learning about what waiting does. It actually builds strength. It builds uh, perseverance in us. It builds character in us. Uh, and last week I preached on the topic of patience. And the title of that sermon was Patience is Power. And if you were here last week, you know we had some, some weights up here, some dumbbells up here. And a couple strong guys came up and they kind of held those weights out like this. And we were looking at the reality that, that patience builds power through resistance to pressure. When we stay up under the pressure, then power is built. And, and we, you know, we explored this, this idea of patience. But the problem is that it's one thing to tell somebody to be patient, Right? It's another thing to actually teach somebody how to develop patience. It's, it's one thing to say, in fact, have, have you ever had anybody tell you, be patient? You ever had them tell you that? It's like when somebody tells you to relax. It actually has the opposite effect. You know, people go, hey, man, relax. You want to go, no, no, you relax, okay? I'm not going to relax, you know? And it's the same with patience. When somebody says, just be patient, it's really hard to, to know what that means. Being patient is not easy to do. And so what I want to do today is, is in the final installment of this series is to drill down just a little deeper into the scriptures to discover how God can demonstrate to us and teach us how we can exercise patience, how we can develop patience in our life. Because patience is hard. Waiting is hard. This week I got on the phone to call the insurance company to make sure that our 2019 insurance is up to date. I was on the phone. Before I spoke to a live person, I was on the phone for 27 minutes on hold, 27 minutes. You don't feel the pain of that like I felt the pain of that. I was dying. I, I was not waiting patiently on the phone. I was slowly dying inside, you know. I was, you know, if you, if you watch a video online and the little, the little watermark comes up at the bottom that says skip this ad, how many of you just rejoice when you see that? You just, <laughs> you just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to skip this, ad, right? But when the thing comes up that says your video will play after the ad, you know. No, I'm not having that. I'm not interested in that. We, um, we were on vacation uh, last summer, and we were in Chicago. And we were walking through the streets of Chicago, and there are six of us. And so we take up, we take up a whole sidewalk when we walk. And how many know there's a difference between vacation walk and work walk? You know, it's a difference. And so we're doing the vacation walk, you know, which is kind of a stroll like this. But the people in Chicago were not on vacation. They were trying to get to work. And so they're, you know, like, you know, like doing that kind of thing, you know, um, <laughs> like you've never done that uh, because patience is hard. It's really hard to be patient. I used to work for a guy who would say to me over and over, he'd, he'd say, Rome, we got a dollar waiting on a dime here, a dollar waiting on a dime. And I was like, first, I didn't know what that meant. And then I realized he's saying that he was the dollar and I was the dime. And like, we need to get my thing done so we could get the important thing done. You can use that you know, with your kids. Um, 
So patience is hard. So how do we develop this kind of patience that God is calling us to? How do we wait? Because these are funny, like, you know, fun examples. But some of you are waiting now in your life in non-funny ways. Some of you are waiting for that person to come and love you and find that person who you can love, and you have been waiting for a long time. And you've tried to be patient, and you've tried to do the things that you know to do, and you've been on, you know, a Go Fish or whatever the other dating apps are, and you've, you've, you've been waiting, and you've been like, is it called Go Fish? No. Oh, that's a card game. Um, no wonder you haven't found someone to love. No, just kidding. Um, something, fish in the sea, there is something like that. I don't know. Somebody Google that. But you've been waiting for it. All the single people are like, forget it, man. I'm checked out of this sermon already. Uh, some of you are waiting. You, you, you've been on LinkedIn like a thousand times. Your resume is updated to the T. You've, you've networked. You've reached out to people. You've interacted. And it's just not coming through. And the holidays are coming, and the money is tight, and you're going, God, I'm waiting on you, and I'm trying to have some patience here, but I'm struggling because it's hard to wait. It's hard to wait. It's hard to be patient. Some of you have a, a child that is out wandering. You, you pointed them in the direction when you raised them. You pointed them in a direction, but somehow they got off the direction that you pointed them in. And now they're out wandering in the darkness, and you're praying and going, God, I'm waiting I'm trying to wait for it, but God, I need you to intervene, and I don't know how to wait for this patiently because I'm, I'm worried. I'm anxious. That's what impatience does. It causes us to be, it causes our blood pressure to go up. We become anxious. We become fretful. We, we worry. We become nervous about the future because we don't know what the future holds, and so it's hard to wait for it. It's hard. So when, when we, we see these scriptures that say, be patient, and then the question comes, how, God, how can I start to learn that patience? Because I don't have it all the time. And when I don't have it, then I end up doing things and saying things I wish I hadn't done or said. A lot of times, my impatience drives me to do things that ha don't speed up the process. They actually slow down the process, right? You ever sent a text and wish you could have unsent that text because you got impatient? How many of you ever sent an email where there were any, any of the email was all caps? Come on, somebody. <laughs> any of you, right? Because you got impatient, you're like, and so, right, you know. <laughs> but impatience is, is, you know, it's just something that, that's, that's part of our life, and we struggle with it. And, you know, we want to not be impatient, and God is calling us to be patient, and we know that when we're not, because here's the thing, impatience doesn't speed up the process. Impatience actually makes the process harder. You know, when you're, wa when you're waiting patiently for something, you're good. But when you're waiting impatiently for something, man, you're just, it's driving you nuts. So when we look at this scriptures that God is calling us to wait and be patient, I've been wondering this week, like, God, so what do you mean? Like, how do we do this? Well, how do we actually develop? What's the key? What's the code, right? So I want to speak today um, from this scripture. I'm going to read you this, the last line in this scripture again. It's so fascinating. Here's what it says. The last line has just caught my attention all week. It says, if we hope for what we do not yet have, if we hope then we wait for it patiently. So that's a conditional statement. If hope, then patience. There's somehow or other where hope and patience are tied together. There's some way or other where patience is dependent upon hope. Now, that's a, that's a hard concept for me to get because a lot of times when we talk about hope, it's really sort of, it has no teeth. For us, sometimes hope is like, you know, well, I you know, hope it doesn't rain, right? How does that make me more patient? So I want to spend some time today speaking on the subject, the foundation of hope. The foundation of hope. You remember the song that we sang a few minutes ago? My hope is built on nothing less, right? What is the foundation of your hope? What is the foundation of your hope? When we think about hope, a lot of times we're talking about uh, you know, very, very vague, ideal kind of desires. When we say hope, a lot of times we just mean want, right? Boy, I sure hope the Cardinals win the pennant, you know? I sure hope the Chiefs beat the Patriots this year. Amen, somebody. Come on, I hope they, <laughs> right? I, it's, it's like a thing that may happen and may not, and I don't have any control over it, and it's kind of like, wouldn't it be nice, 
Wouldn't it be cool if, right? So then when I think about hope, I go, God, how does hope help me to have patience? How can you say that if we have hope, then we can wait patiently? And so the more I looked into it and prayed and studied this week, this scripture just kept coming back. And so I started to drill down on it. I want to get in a little bit into the weeds with you on this. Because when the Apostle Paul uses the word hope in the scripture, he's not talking about some vague, open-ended desire, some vague, general, ethereal, maybe it'll work out. When he uses the word hope, the Greek word that he uses is a word called elpis, elpis. And this word doesn't mean maybe it'll work out, hopefully, we don't know. Elpis is the Greek word that is, it says confident assurance of a future outcome that is sure or certain. That doesn't sound like the kind of hope that we talk about. This is, a, this is a deeper kind. This is a biblical hope. This is a God-based hope. This is a hope built on a sure foundation. He says it's, com- it's confident assurance of a future outcome that is sure or certain. The other definition is to anticipate usually with pleasure. In other words, I have a sense of where things are going. I have a very strong confidence that things are going to turn out well. Therefore, it's a lot easier for me to wait for it. How many of you know it's a lot easier to wait for something that you know is going to happen that's going to be good, right? If, you, if you've read the last chapter in the book, then you don't worry about all of the chapters leading up to it because you know how it's going to turn out. If you've seen the last act of the movie, you know how it's going to turn out. It's not going to make you nervous during the act two because you're not going to be anxious during act two because you have a confident assurance that it's going to turn out a certain way. And the Apostle Paul is saying, if you have hope... If you have a confident assurance that the outcome is going to be good, that is how you can wait for it patiently. So if you want to develop patience, we've got to have hope. We've got to have a confident assurance of what God has in store for us down the road. Hope breeds patience. And then the Apostle Paul uses an example that I want to give you, uh, an illustration of one of the patriarchs uh, from the Old Testament and his name is Abraham, and we know him as the father of the faithful, but when the Apostle Paul talks about him in this passage, he doesn't talk about his faith so much as he talks about his hope. Now look at what he says here. He says, against all hope, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Now let's think about that for a minute. What that means is when there was no grounds for you to have any confident assurance in the outcome, he still had confident assurance in the outcome. Against all hope, when there was no reason to hope, when there was no external circumstances that would have given rise to hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. He still had a confident assurance in what God had for him, believed, and so became the father of many nations, being, what, fully persuaded. Not like, hmm, I hope this works out. Those of you who don't know the story of Abraham and Sarah, God promised them a son. They got really old, and I mean really old. He was 100, she was 90, no son. And yet he remained fully persuaded uh, that God had power to do what he had promised. Here's what I want you to get today. Write this down. When you believe in the promise, you can wait for the payoff. When you believe in the promise, you can wait for the It's a lot easier to wait on the Lord when you have antis- confident anticipation that he's going to work it out in the end. It's a lot easier to wait on God when you, there's a sense of sureness when there's a confidence, when there's an eager expectation, when your hope is built in what he has for you, when you trust that the present suffering is not worth comparing with the future glory, when you trust that the future is better than the present, then you can have patience for it. Um, Some of you have heard the story I I tell every once in a while that when Rebecca and I first started dating, that's when we learned about our relative degrees of patience and impatience. It's real quiet because you don't know where I'm going with this story, do you? Some of you do. Um, I was impatient. I wanted to move things a little bit more quickly in terms of, I wanted, I wanted her MySpace account to change from, I thought I'd get a little something from MySpace. No MySpace? Okay. My MySpace account to move from single to in a relationship. Not my MySpace account. I didn't have one. I was too old for that. But she had a MySpace account. And I wanted, I wanted to move her off the market. I wanted to get her out of the available. I wanted to get her out of the Go Fish group. All right? Just keep going with me. All right? I wanted to get her into, I wanted to get her into the fence of our relationship. I wanted to, right? And so I was moving quickly in this relationship. I was, 
I was trying to make the relationship move forward more quickly than was warranted. And at a certain point in the relationship, Rebecca kind of pumped the brakes. And she said, you know, this is like three months in when I'm trying to get her to marry me like in two weeks. You know what I mean? <laughs> Seriously. And she's like, okay, we need to slow this thing down a little bit, right? And I'm impatient, and she's being patient, and I'm being impatient. And so I had to bring this to God. And this was real. You know, I, I joke around about it, but this was real for me. And I start to bring it to God, and I start to learn a couple things from God in the relationship. How many of you know that hope is built through hardship? It's built, hope actually is built through hardship. In fact, one of the things, I don't have this scripture for you on the screen, but the Apostle Paul says this. He says, we glory in our sufferings. In other words, we glory, we hold our head up in the midst of pressure because, he said, we know that pressure produces perseverance. And then he says, and you know what per perseverance produces? It produces character. And you know what character produces, he says? Character produces hope. It produces hope. So hope arises in the midst of hardship. Hope arises because you've struggled. Hope arises because you've struggled before and God has seen you through. So you can look back at the times that you were hurting and struggling before and you can go, hey, you know what? God brought me through before so I have confident assurance that he's going to bring me through again. I've got hope for a future because I've seen him in the past. I've got hope that God's got something for me that's good, even though I don't know what it is, because he keeps working things out for the good of those who love the Lord according to uh, his promises. He does it every time. So hope arises in hardship. And so we were in kind of a pressure cooker of this very young relationship, and it was very intense, and I was very impatient. And I learned a few things, and one is I learned that uh, if you rush it, you ruin it. All right? You may want to just write that down. If you rush it, whatever it is, if you rush it, you're going to ruin it. If you try to make things go more quickly than they need to go, uh, you're going to blow it, all right? So be patient. <laughs> uh, if you rush it, you're going to ruin it. The other thing I learned is this. I learned, it, you know, as we were dating, she belongs to God. She doesn't actually belong to me. She belongs to God. So, so you know, so if I'm trying to rush her, now I'm trying to rush him. He doesn't like to be rushed. He's, he actually created the universe in his own time. I wasn't there when he did that. I wasn't there when he put the stars in the sky. Um, I wasn't there when he carved out the sea and the oceans and the mountains. I wasn't really there. He, he did that on his own time. So if I try to rush her, then I'm trying to rush him. And then the third thing I learned that, in fact, I belong to him too, which means if she belongs to him and I belong to him, the whole thing belongs to him. And so I'm going to have some confident assurance that he's going to do with this thing what he wants to do and that it's going to be good, that he's going to work it out for his glory and for our good. So I'm going to trust him with that. And when I began to have the confident assurance that God had the end uh, the way that he designed it and the end was going to be better than the present, then I started to become more patient. I was able to wait for it. I was able to say, okay, so this is not mine. This is not hers. This is God's. Now, this is for you. I don't know what your situation is. It might be work, school, kids, whatever. It's not yours. It's God's. It's his, and he's working it out for his glory and for your good. So that gives you some confident assurance that you can kind of just wait for it. And so I started to get patient in the relationship. I really did. I started to calm down to the extent that my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, started saying, huh, you think we should go ahead and set a date to go ahead and get married? And I was like, you know what, babe, just have patience. Just, <laughs> just waiting on the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? <laughs> Try it, guys. Um, so uh, the, the, the reason that we can wait with confident assurance is because we recognize that when God is in it, then it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. That the thing that God has for us is better, it's so much better than the pressure that we're experiencing right now, that the present suffering we're experiencing does not compare with the glory that he has for us down the road. I don't really worry about how pressured I was back in those days. I don't really think about that anymore. I don't really worry about how stressful that was for me because it was, for me, it was worth the wait. Today, just by the way, today is today, December 16th, our 11-year anniversary. Today, okay, four babies later. And, and it was worth it. So, so, so when, you're, when you're expecting God to fulfill his promise, it becomes a lot easier to wait for it. If you own a car that you haven't paid for outright, if you own a house that you're paying on, you have entered into a promissory note. 
You have issued a promissory note. A promissory note is a, a, a legal document that requires you, the issuer of the note, to pay the payee a certain amount at a fixed date. And you've issued that note. So on my house, I've written a promissory note. Dear Bank of America, I will pay you for this house. I don't have the money right now, but I will pay you. Now, you know, Bank of America doesn't call me every 15 minutes. Nobody at Bank of America is wringing their hands going, I wonder if he's going to pay on this. I wonder if he's going to. Because I've been making my payments, so they're going, okay, I think he's going to pay on it. We're gonna, I, get a, I trust his promise so I can, wait for, I can wait for the payoff. In fact, they don't even want me to pay it off early because then they don't get all the interest that they would get if I wait. Right. So, so they can wait for the payoff because they trust in the promise. Sometimes we have trouble trusting in God's promises. Therefore, we get impatient for the payoff. We, we struggle with trusting God's promise. If we believe that God's promises are yea and amen, if we believe that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, if we believe that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, if we believe that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, if, if we believe in his promises, it becomes a lot easier to wait for his payoff. It becomes a lot easier if we have confident assurance, if we have hope, then we can wait. Let me show you something else in this scripture that really... It really blew my, blew my mind. Um, if you pull the scripture back up, it says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Okay. So this is, this is two ideas crashing together. Hope and faith. In hope, believed. Right? So in hope, that's hope. Believed, that's faith. In hope, he believed. Here's, here's what, ha what is happening in this passage, and here's what is so important for you. Because a lot of us understand the idea of faith. It's confidence in God, right? We know, we know some scriptures. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? So we know what faith is, right? But we don't really know what hope is. We can quote scriptures on faith, right? For by grace we have been saved through faith and not not of ourselves. It is impossible to please God without faith, right? We, a lot of Christians, they'll, we got faith scriptures like just dripping off of us, right? But we don't have a lot of hope scriptures. And what God is trying to do and show us in this passage and what is happening uh, for Abraham in this, ha in this passage is that he is demonstrating that faith is confidence. Here's a way to look at it. Faith is confidence in God's character, but hope is confidence in God's power. In other words, faith is confidence that, uh, that God is good. Hope is confidence that God's goodness can be enacted into my future. Are you with me? My favorite story on this in the scripture is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I've told this before, but they're getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, says, you know, I want you to bow down and worship my God. And they're saying, no, we're not going to worship your God. And then they, they give this, this three-part answer. They say, we know that our God can save us. Can. So that's faith. We, we got faith in our God. Then they say, we know that our God will save us. So that's faith looking to the future, right? We know that he will save us. I have, hope, I have confident assurance of a certain outcome, of a sure outcome. He will save us. And then they say, but even if he doesn't save us, we're still not going to bow down. Now, that's commitment, and we're going to talk about that in January. So just put that on the back burner, all right? But the hope part is not only do I believe in God. Think of it like this. You can write this down. Faith is confidence in what God can do. Hope is confidence in what God will do. This is when we, this is when we move from, you know, I, I trust God. I trust his character. I know who he is. I trust that he is a good God. But to go from there to like, hey, I actually trust that God is going to enact his goodness in my life, in my future, in my experience, in my circumstances, in my pain, that's hope. The scripture uses, there, there are 50 uses of the word hope in the New Testament. In this letter alone, in the letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul uses that word 13 times because he's trying to teach us something. And it's a nuance. It's subtle, right? Faith and hope are very, almost interchangeable in some ways. But, but if you take faith and you just project it into your future, now you've got hope. Now you've got confident assurance of a future outcome. My little two-year-old Eden, she... Uh, like, likes to crawl up on the countertop. This is her thing. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a fan because, you know, it's high. And she's two. But this is what she does. Climbs on the stool, takes to the stool to the table, from the table to the countertop. It's her, it's, her, it's her mojo. That's what she does. She gets up there. And the other day I'm walking through the 
through the uh, kitchen towards the refrigerator, and she's sitting up on the counter, and she does this. She goes, catch me, Dad, and she flings herself, flings herself off the counter. I didn't tell my wife that one I was <laughs> <laughs> until just now. But it's our 11-year anniversary. I have a beautiful card and so stuff. Um, so she throws herself. Now, fortunately, I wasn't holding a cup of coffee, and with cat-like reflexes, I turned and I caught her. And, you know, for her, it was no big deal. But here's the two things that are demonstrated, and I don't recommend that you do this with your children, but, but faith says, my dad can catch me. Hope says, my dad will catch me. And so, therefore, I'm going to throw myself right off of this counter, <laughs> right? <laughs> Boom. Sometimes we have faith. We know what God can do, but I don't know about you. For me, it's hard to move the faith into the future. Hope is faith looking forward. Hope is faith looking forward. Hope is you being able to relax in the waiting because you are confident. You are confident and assured that the outcome is good. You might not know the specifics of the outcome, but you know the nature of the outcome. You trust that God is going to work it out for his glory and for your good. Therefore, you trust him. Therefore, you can have patience in the waiting. Ernest, come up and help me close this out. You can have patience in the waiting. I want to give you one last scripture. And this, just, this scripture, I think, captures so much of, of what we're trying to, trying to get in this, in this whole series. This is from Jeremiah, and it says this. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. God is saying, I know, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do in relation to you. I know the plans that I have for you. You, mo you might not know them, but I know them. I know the plans that I have. And you know, when he says, I know what I'm going to do, he does what he said he was going to do. When he says, I know what I'm going to do, he's going to do the thing that he knows he's going to do. He has foreknowledge. I know the plans I have for you. It's not like, I wonder, I wonder if I know what I'm going to do. I, know, I, wonder, I wonder how this is going to work. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Plans to give you hope. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hope is faith looking forward. Some of you today are experiencing that very, very hard period of waiting. And you've been waiting for a long time. And you have been trying to be patient, but you don't know how to be patient. And you're anxious, you're worried, you're nervous about how things are going to turn out. It's the end of the year. Next year's coming. There's a, lot, there's a lot of pressure. There's some hardship. There's some difficulty. And even if it's generally good, there's still some parts of your life where you're like, man, I just, that part, I'm almost, I'm, I'm just almost avoiding that right now because I just don't know how that's going to turn out. And God is saying, look, I have a future and a hope for you. I want you to have confident assurance in the way this thing is going to turn out. Because when you have that confident assurance, when you have hope as your foundation, then you can wait for it. Because you can trust it. And because you know it's going to be worth the wait. And so today, I just want to close out by asking you this question. What's the foundation of your hope? Where is your hope? Is it in something uncertain? Because that will make you anxious. You will continue to worry. You will continue to fret when you don't have to. But if your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, then you can have patience to wait for it. You can trust in a God who loves you. You can trust in a God who wants to make your future so much better than your present that your present sufferings are not worthy to compare to the glory that he has for his children. Let's stand together.